Hello, who's ready for a good crunchy technical talk right before lunch? I'm super excited to be here. This is my first technical talk in Africa, and um, so it's a whole new continent, and I'm very excited. This talk is actually a testing talk, but I didn't say so in the title because sometimes people will duck out if they think I'm going to talk to them about testing. Um, you know who you are, and yet you still have to listen to this. I've got you trapped. So, why is it this always works in testing? There we go. So, the year I was 12, my parents gave this to me for Christmas, possibly because they hate me. Um, if you're going to buy one of these for your children, buy the easy version and not like the level 12 version because it was terrible. Uh, you had to have everything, all the posts in exactly the right place and you had to have the clips exactly aligned in the right place. And if you got any of this wrong, uh, marble would fly off the track and hypothetically hit your sister in the head. Um, hypothetically. So it was really terrible. And um, I struggled with it for weeks, and I finally ended up begging a family friend who is a literal robotics engineer at JPL to help me. And it took him and me another two days to get it put together so that my space coaster worked. But when you think about it, that's really what software is like, right? It, it's not just that you can build software, it's that you have to build software as a collection of components that work together. And if you get any of them wrong, everything flies off the track and falls over. And we have a lot of like metrics and tools and, and patterns for how we can do these things properly, but really a lot of the time the marble flies off the track and everything goes wrong. And this is like a simplified software diagram. Like you're all looking at this going, both that seems terrible and that is not representing everything that's happening, right? So that's where we're at right now. Um, there's a talk that DHH gave at RailsConf in 2018, the, the keynote, and it's called Fix Me. And he talked about something called conceptual compression, which is the thing that we're doing where we used to talk to computers by directly programming them. Like, I learned to program using BASIC. And then we got sort of more layers of abstraction so we didn't have to talk directly to how computers work. We talked to programs that talked to programs that talked to programs that talked to the computer core, right? All of these layers of compression make it easier for us to understand what we're doing, but it also means that it is literally impossible for any of us to fully describe how our systems work. You may know how your software works entirely. If you do, I'm super impressed but you probably don't know entirely how your development engines work, entirely how your IDEs work, entirely how your chips work. And we've learned the hard way that all of these parts matter and that even though we don't have to pay attention to them, we are still dependent on them. That's where we are right now. We have this huge dependency stack that we have conceptually compressed and it turns out that that's gonna bite us on the ass sometimes because it turns out that our chips were like psychically intuiting our passwords before we said them and um, it's a vulnerability. The future is fractal. So all of that is true and also it's getting worse all the time because we're moving into the microservice environment and people are building more and more things that interact independently without knowing about each other, which seems great and it seems like it could almost reduce complexity because if you have a black box that has an input and an output, how hard can it be to connect them together? Uh, well, the answer is really hard because you don't know what's going on inside the black box. So how can we do any kind of effective testing if we don't know what's happening inside everything that we're touching? Well, let's stop and think about why we test. What is it that we are trying to derive from tests? It used to be that you would measure your competence as a system administrator. How many of you used to run systems? Systems administrators, yeah? A few, the few, the brave, the, brow, yeah, the proud, the grizzled. Um, it used to be that you measured your system success and uptime. The longer you can keep a server alive, the more successful you were. That's not how we do it anymore um, because we believe in patching now. 
Um, but patching didn't used to be a thing. Like, you had, you had uptime. That was it. So the way we measure tests right now, and I heard a question about it in the last talk, what percentage of code coverage do you have? What's your test coverage? How much of your code is covered by a test? What exactly does that measure? What is the value of having test coverage on your code? Well, it means that theoretically, if you run the test, you're going to know whether the software is going to behave the way you expected when you ran the test. OK, that's good. Like, that's a baseline. That's something we need. But it's maybe not everything we need in order to deliver things to our customers, in order to deliver things that are useful and practical. So what do we test for? How is it that we need to understand our software in order to test for it? Before you can test, you have to figure out what the purpose of testing is. Is it you want to make sure your service never goes down? You want to make sure your service is 100% correct? You want to make sure your service is 100% auditable? Those are all different test cases. And although you may think, well, of course, I need all of those, as in the rest of the world, it's all about compromise. You can't have all of those. You can't, you cannot have 100% uptime. You can pay for nines of uptime with hundreds of thousands of dollars every time you add a decimal point. But you will never get to 100 because it's not mathematically possible. I put this slide in a ton of talks because it's so good. Charity Majors, who came down here and spoke two years ago, something like that, uh, said, and I truly believe, nines don't matter if your user is unhappy. It doesn't matter how stable your system is. It doesn't matter how amazing it is. It doesn't matter if you're doing something novel. It doesn't matter what kind of API language you're using. If your users aren't happy, you're not selling things, you're not succeeding. So maybe test coverage needs to consider user, sa user satisfaction. The trouble with tests is that they are toil. And toil is defined by Liz Fong Jones as something that is manual, repetitive, automatable, tactical. It doesn't have enduring value, and it scales badly. How much of that sounds like testing to you, right? And we automate a lot of it, but it's still tedious. It's still like something that we're going through to have gone through it. Useful tests would give us some data about what we're doing and how we're serving our users. So it should, a useful test might include end-to-end -end message time, um, availability of your service, request performance, which sounds like end-to-end -end message time is not actually the same thing. End-to-end -end message time is if you can get something in the system, how long does it take to get it back out? Request response is can you get something in the system? Accurate responses. When people ask for something, do they get what they expect in return? Uh, usability. Is it something that they can actually use in their real life? And accessibility. And this is something we almost never think of putting in our test suites up front until we get that one person who complains about it all the time and you're like, oh, why are you like this? It's fine. I'm here to tell you you are all only temporarily able-bodied. All of us are only temporarily able-bodied. And lots of us in this room are not, in fact, fully able-bodied. 8% of men are red-green colorblind. Lots of them don't know it. Like, there's a joke about how men don't perceive color the same way. It's because, like, almost 10% of them can't tell the difference between red and green and brown. It's the same color. Um, a lot of us have uh, vision correction. I think about this all the time because it was like three years ago when I went to read my schedule on the back of my badge, and my eyes are fine, thank you very much, um, but my arm was not long enough for me to see the print on the back of the badge. And like, that's funny, okay, I got glasses, that's fine. But then you think about the fact that we're putting out apps that are meant to be viewed on our expensive monitors, and they're actually being seen on tiny Android screens that have been scratched, that have unmovable print size on them, right? If you're not testing for accessibility, 
you are not serving your users. So build it in right away, because trying to add things in after the fact, after you've built software, if you don't have any hooks for them, it's sort of like trying to shove chocolate chips in a cookie that you've already baked. It's just, it's just not as good. So you don't have to build the whole system out, but you do need to leave hooks in there for the things that you are going to put in later, and one of them needs to be accessibility. So what's a facade test? What are tests that we do that make us feel better that aren't actually useful? I think of this as like a Potemkin village of testing. Um, code coverage. It's a great looking statistic. It doesn't tell you anything about whether or not your software is working or serving user needs. Uh, if you only test the happy path, that's great. You do need to test the happy path, but that's not the problem. The problem is much weirder than that. Only clean data. This is why I talk a lot about testing in production, because there is nothing as weird as production data. There are people who have one-letter last names. There are people who decline to cite a gender. There are people who have been on this system since you rewrote it like the last three times. They still have an account. I have a Sprint account that's 15 years old. Um, I'm sure Sprint hates me. They're like, please, please, for the love of God, get a new plan. Um, but they still have to keep all of my data for the last 15 years because that's still relevant to how they operate with me. So if you're only testing like test data, you're not really testing what's gonna happen in production. And if you're testing on staging, who here can afford an all up full replica of production in staging? You, you have a lot of money, excellent. <laughs> Small environment? <laughs> Either way, anybody who's operating at scale can't really test in staging. Staging is a lie that we tell ourselves to, to, so that we can sleep at night um, because we don't want to be testing in production. But the reality is, of course we're testing in production. Uh, we just know because there are outages. So what's the beautiful future look like? If, if that's what we're dealing with right now, if that's how testing works, if that's how microservices work, let's talk about where we could be heading. I want a self-healing network. The very dawn of the internet in America was something called DARPAnet. And we built it to survive the Cold War. We built it planning to be nuked by the Ruskies. Like, this is the thing, right? So we're like, okay, so is this still gonna work if somebody wipes out Chicago? Well, all of the systems previously had sort of uh, deterministic flows. So like, you're going to go this way and through this node and through this node. DARPAnet had non-deterministic flow. You could say, I want a message to get from here to here and I don't care how it does it, right? I don't care. If you go through Albuquerque on your way from San Francisco to Los Angeles, fine, as long as you get there. I think that our whole understanding of the network that we work in has to remember that that's where we came from. That we came from a self-healing, self-modular network that didn't care about how it got there, it just cared that it did get there. And if we build that into our systems, we're gonna make them much more resilient. And I think that's especially important in a world where you have load shedding, and in a world where you have cable cutting, and a world where you have backhoes. Like, I don't know if this happens here, but it happens all the time in the Midwest. Somebody's building a building and they um, backhoe through the fiber. And uh, then you're like, well, I guess I have no internet today at all. So we need to be thinking about how to build not deterministic, but non-deterministic node networks. This is a picture of the worst thing that can happen to a power grid. It is even worse than your power plants are insufficient to your need. This is Ottawa, and they got hit by a tornado. They didn't used to get tornadoes. Events occur, climate changes. Um, they got hit by a tornado, and it hit their main distribution center. So this distribution center absorbed the whole hydroelectric output of two enormous dams, and then redistributed it to different um, substations, 
which then went out to the whole city of Ottawa, okay? The tornado took the roof off the distribution center. It took down the lines. This distribution center was offline and unlikely to come back online for two months. And Ottawa was like, uh, two months is not an amount of time that we can go without electricity in half of our, our suburbs, our city. And so what they did was they spent a lot of time figuring out how to route around it. So they are running a bunch of things in excess of their nominal capacity, which they know is going to burn it out faster, uh, but it means they get electricity. They're running some things inefficiently. They're running things more expensively. They're not quite operating at full power, but they're very close. And they're managing it because the electrical network is a network and not a unidirectional like fan of distribution points. So if there's an emergency, how do we route around it? How do we self-heal that problem? The beautiful future is modular and full of microservices. The line between yours, mine, and ours is getting blurrier all the time. It used to be we knew what software we were in control of because we wrote it all. Uh, but like we're saying, maybe you should just write the things that are your core business value and make sure that you're not wasting time on things that somebody else has done better. But that means that you're going to have to let APIs write to your systems. And you're going to have to have your systems write out to APIs and you're going to have to have an understanding of your network that doesn't just include things that you wrote and you control, but also that other people wrote and other people control. And how do you manage that? The, your microservices and third-party microservices are going to interpenetrate, and it's only going to get more complicated. And I think that's a really exciting time. It means that we have to think about how we're going to do isolations and how we're going to do load shedding for requests. Like, if you have an API feeding data into you and suddenly they go nuts and they're feeding 900 times more data in than they did yesterday, uh, probably there's a problem and probably your system isn't scaled to meet that. So how do you shut them up without breaking your system? So, I talk a lot about APIs in this talk, and I went and found a good definition that I like, which is, of course, from SmartBear, who is a bunch of swagger people. And it says, an API is a distinctive method of developing software systems that tries to focus on building single function modules with well-defined interfaces and operations. Microservices. Single function modules. If your microservice description has the word and in it, you screwed up. Right? This is a really key thing to understand because it's so easy to say, well, it's very much like this other thing. And, and, and. Same with feature flags. If your feature flag ever says, and, I'm probably judging you because it's, <laughs> it's trying to do too many things at once. In the beautiful future, semantics matter more than syntax. So remember I talked about my friend who worked at JPL? Uh, Pathfinder is part of what he designed. And we didn't have to teach Pathfinder how to bounce when it landed on Mars, uh, because physics took care of that. And it turns out that physics can take care of a lot of problems. And if we write an engine that simulates physics, we don't have to write meticulous analysis of everything that happens. So who here played Angry Birds? Yeah? So there's a physics engine in Angry Birds, right? It's not like they chart out which path is going to, you know, reach your goal. It's like, this is how physics works when you fling birds at pigs. Um, <laughs> go to. Like, just have fun with that. Um, same with Goat Simulator, except the physics engine for the goat neck is really weird. <laughs> yeah, see, now I know who, who played Goat Simulator. That's super creepy. But, um, <laughs> But what happens is, instead of having to identify each thing that happens, what we're going to say is, this is the general range of things that are acceptable. This is the physics engine for how our system is going to work. I don't have to define each outcome. That's going to be super important, because it does a ton of work for us, 
and we get almost identical results. In the beautiful future, we're going to test experience and not embodiment. So what do I mean by that? It's really easy for our test to cover, for us to think of test as real and test results as real. Test results aren't real. Test results are an indicator. They're a symptom of something that's happening, but they are not actually what's happening, right? Monitoring and observability are actually what's happening. But test results are just like, this thing may happen in the future given the same set of circumstances. So what we need to be testing is what's actually happening, not what we think is going to happen. So my example for this is the thyroid. When you go to the doctor, your doctor does not say, is your thyroid failing? They say, how are you feeling? Is your hair falling out? Is your skin super dry? What's going on? They use that as a proxy for whether or not your thyroid is working. And then if they suspect that your thyroid is not working, it's not like they can test your thyroid hormones. Because that's not a thing. The thyroid produces like a thousand hormones. What they do is they test your level of thyroid stimulating hormone. And if they find that your TSH is really high, they realize that something's gone wrong with your thyroid because the rest of your body is like, hello, give me the hormones. And your thyroid's like, what? <laughs> what? I can't hear you. So it's not like we're ever directly interacting with the thyroid. We are interacting with the symptoms, with the, the distance of the thyroid. But that still gives us a great idea of what's going on in the body. So when you're doing testing, remember that you're not ever actually talking to the thyroid. You're talking to the symptoms which may or may not be that problem. So I promised you Tinker Toys. Why are microservices like Tinker Toys? A lot of us talk about Legos, but here's, here's my thing. Tinker Toys are useless in isolation. Tinker Toys are like the hub, or uh, microservices are like the hubs of a Tinker Toy. You could maybe stack them up. Nothing interesting happens. And the connections, the channels for communication are like the spokes. And you can play pickup sticks, nothing interesting happens. It is only when you understand that APIs and their connecting channels do not exist in isolation, but in community, that you understand how the system works. You don't get anything until you put them together. We talk a lot about Legos, we say APIs are like Legos, because there's this very firm language in how we talk about them. And in fact, Lego enthusiasts have a whole lexicon of how to describe blocks to each other. And um, there, there's a type of building style called snot, which is studs not on top. I'm like, wow, I'm not sure if that was an accident or not, but I salute you for going forward with it. Um, but in that same way, we're all counting on REST and GraphQL to have a predictable set of ways to describe each other and allow us to plug in. When we think about APIs, we think about what API users want, and this is what you have to test for. They want to connect securely, right? They don't want somebody else using their license. Uh, they want data to be handled consistently because there's nothing worse than sending the same request and getting different results. It's, it's not a good time. Uh, we want to get confirmations, like, am I talking to the right thing? We want to pass states through accurately, so we don't want to be munging or mangling the data in a way that's unexpected. And we want to spend the least possible effort doing all of the above, because we're essentially lazy. Humans are lazy, we would like to just do the thing the fastest way possible. So that's what API users want. They want an API to be easy to play with. When I started working with API documentation, I fell in love with Swagger. It was amazing. It was so cool. You could like generate APIs from JSON documentation. Like, how, how is that not magical? Um, and I was trying to make it work, and I spent two weeks trying to get this JSON file to work, and I couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. 
And it finally took somebody from the outside to point out that I needed to have a working web server in order to get it to render. I'm like, well, that's dumb. <laughs> They've since fixed it. There's now a way that you can do a sandbox of it. But I think it's really important when we're writing APIs to make sure that people don't have to go through a lot of hoops to be able to use it. Uh, we want it to be easy to integrate with. We want to be able to understand how we're going to connect to this particular part. Remember what I said about how Lego has a, a taxonomy, a description for all of the, the bricks? We want to know which brick we're connecting to. We want to hide the mess. So um, have you ever worked with a, a code base where things are named after trees, birds, or Simpsons characters? Yeah, so APIs allow us to hide all of that gross stuff, sort of like shoving things in the oven when you have company coming over, which is not a thing I've ever done. Um, <laughs> but the API, it doesn't matter what's behind the API. If it's predictable, it could be the worst piece of COBOL garbage ever. Um, actually, COBOL is very seldom garbage. It's a different, different era. But it could be the worst piece of garbage ever and it doesn't matter because the front end looks fine. It's an API. We want it to be elegant. And I think that's a really important thing to think about. What is it that we're looking for? We don't want to add things for no good reason. It's important that every function do something meaningful. And I think this is something that's very easy for us to fall into as developers. It's like, ooh, and it would be cool if, but remember what I said about and? And is your problem. It's not and cool if. Just do the thing and do it well. And if you want to do something else, make sure the users actually want it. So why do APIs fail? Uh, well, security is hard to do. And you should just hire somebody to do it. Uh, don't try and roll your own off. Did we already say that enough? Because I really, really believe this. Um, in a different talk, I have a picture of, you know the woman who tried to fix the painting of Jesus in Italy, Spain? And it was monkey Jesus? Yeah, when you roll your own crypto and your own auth, you are just making monkey Jesus, please stop. <laughs> um, we have an egocentric data design. We assume that everyone who's consuming our data wants to consume it the way that we want to consume it. We don't ever ask people and reach out and say, hey, how are you consuming this data? Like, what's meaningful to you? We assume, because we bill on minutes, that you want to consume by minutes. But maybe what you actually care about is when you're talking. Maybe you, what you actually care about is who you're talking to. So we design these systems so that only we can use them. And then the API fails because people can't use them for their use case. Inconsistent endpoints. It's really hard to make something work if it's not predictable. The thing about laziness is that if it runs into a roadblock, we just sort of throw up our hands and go, ugh, this is terrible. I hate this API. I'm not using it. Missing information. Documentation is hard. I spent 20 years as a technical writer. It's not that I don't understand the problem of documentation and putting information in. Um, it's that I understand you should probably hire somebody to do that, too. Uh, because you're not doing it well, almost none of you. <laughs> so when we think about testing microservices, we have this problem where we understand that it's combinatorically complex. This is the orbits of Earth and Venus around the year, uh, sun for a year. So this is only two or three objects, depending on how you count it. Look at all those different possibilities. Now we think about hundreds of microservices in our systems, and our brains just explode, and we're like, I can't do microservices, I can't do feature flagging, because it's too complex. There are too many variables. I understand that feeling, but you're wrong. You're going to have to do this, because the beautiful future is coming for you, and because it's already that complex, you've just hidden it from yourselves. So, what we can do in the face of this complexity is stop trying to test everything. You can't. You cannot test everything. And use our brains instead of mindlessly going ahead and assuming that we know what to test. Test that the microservice works. 
Test that the channel you're using to talk to and from it works. Test that the user flow works. And then every time you add something new, whether it's a microservice or a feature flag, you test it in these four ways. Test it with everything on. Please do not show this to everybody. LinkedIn had that problem a few years ago. Uh, somebody managed to turn all of the feature flags on and uh, couldn't turn them all off, and LinkedIn ended up rolling back to a version like six years old and then trying to like, figure out what was supposed to be on. Uh, test it with everything off. If it all breaks because your flags are off, because your microservice isn't working, you have not made a microservice architecture. You have made a distributed monolith. That was not the goal. If your feature flags break when they're all off, if your, if your microservices break because they can't hit your database, rethink your architecture, because you've done it wrong. Um, test the status quo, because there's nothing more vexatious than trying to do troubleshooting, and uh, eventually, like a week later, you realize the problem was it never really worked in the first place. I'd like to say that was a thing that never happened, but it's a thing that happens. And then, finally, when you have these known states, Test the new thing. Test the new microservice. Test the new feature flag. Test the change that you've made. You're only testing the delta then, and that's not so intimidating. That's not so bad. You can set up automated tests to do that. Do all the things in production. Uh, my boss hates it when I go on my kill staging, kill, kill, kill rant, but you have to think about what staging is giving you besides a false sense of security. Because it is false, you're not using real data, you're not using real scale, staging is mostly just to make you feel better. Um, so you're gonna do all the things in production, but you don't wanna show your users all of your disasters in production. So this is where we talk about using feature flags to only release things internally, only release things to your canary group. Microsoft calls this ring deployment, and they have it automated. So it's like, okay, I believe this feature, you know, it's in the code base, it has been checked by all the automated tests, turn it on for 1% of people, turn it on for 10% of people, scale it up and observe it to make sure that it's not failing, and then release it to everybody. And then if it's a release flag, Wait until you're sure it's good, and then pull that flag code out. I get this question all the time. People are like, but what do you do about the fact that you have hundreds of if statements in your code? I'm like, well, you don't leave hundreds of if statements in your code. You pull it out when you've deployed it. There are two kinds of flags, and one of them is the deployment flag, and it should get removed when you're fully deployed. And the other kind is the permanent flag, and it should get marked so that nobody accidentally deletes it because it's the thing that controls what level your users are at, or it's the thing that controls a kill switch, or it's the thing that controls a circuit breaker. Don't take that out, it's permanent. It's load-bearing feature flag. So this is a roadmap for thinking about testing and microservices and feature flags. It may not be your map, but it is a way to think about it. And I want you to like, sort of chew on it a little bit. Like, what, what does that mean? How would that work? Start with small victories. I don't want you to go home and try and refactor everything. I don't want you to go home and throw out all your test suites. That is not what I'm saying. <laughs> I've had people who are like, do you mean I should stop testing? No, you should not stop testing, but you should test smarter. You should think about what your tests are trying to produce. Estimate what's possible for you to accomplish. What is it that you're testing, that your microservice, that your architecture is trying to do? Is that something that you can accomplish? And then, bite by bite, you eat the whale. None of us are really, well, I guess not none, but most of us are not in a position to completely rewrite our code base. We have to live with it. But that doesn't mean we have to live with it in the state that it's in. We can change things gradually. So when this all goes well, when your conversion goes well, when you start being able to control your features individually, when your microservices are properly shaved off of your monolith, it's great. Because nobody notices. 
it's completely invisible, and the only thing that happens is your maintenance tasks go down a ton. The isolation of all of your systems holds, and it's good. If there are any failures, they are not disasters. Because, here's the thing, a disaster is a concatenation of failures. A disaster is never one thing going wrong. It is a collection of things going wrong in a way that accelerates or emphasizes the problem. So, like, that day that you can't find your car keys, that's one thing. That day when you can't find your car keys and you're angry about it and you spill your coffee and then because you spill your coffee, uh, you rear end someone, that's a disaster. So what you want is a system that has little fire breaks in it so that you can stop and say, okay, I'm finding my keys, I'm cleaning up the coffee, I'm pulling off the road before I hit somebody because I just burnt my lap. The same thing applies in your technology. You want to say, hey, this system went down. We took it offline. We already have a placeholder on our website that says, currently out for maintenance. Everything's fine. And the rest of the website works. Isolations are what's going to save you from having full-scale disasters. Because when it's bumpy, you discover disconnects that you never knew you had. And if you have time to turn off that one feature and fix it, or a way to go around it, or a routing that makes it less obvious that you have a problem, it's going to be so much less stressful and chaotic for you to figure out what's going on. So if this was too long and you read Twitter or you're dying for lunch, I made this a little shorter for you, monoliths are the past. Full test coverage is not a thing anymore. What you are testing is more important than how you are testing it and test all the things in production. I pause for taking pictures here. So my <laughs> summary slide. So if you thought this was interesting, you can go here. We will send you a t-shirt. I will make sure they ship them to South Africa. And you can do a 30-day trial of Launch Darkly and think about feature flags. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. I have a couple bandanas for the first people who ask. Yeah, in the back with the wrist brace. A very hypothetical question with regards to the space rails. Did you use your uh, sister hypothetically to test where the balls will fall? Actually, I'm really having trouble hearing you. Can you stand up? <laughs> hypothetically, uh, with the space rails. Did you use your sister to hypothetically test where the balls will fall? No. Nope. Can somebody restate that for me? I'm so sorry. I think it's an accent thing. I really apologize. He, he's saying with the space rails, that you, the example you were making at the beginning, the thing you were building with the balls who were falling, if you were using your sister to, to test where the balls would That's fall. That's true. I was using my sister to test where the balls were going. Um, but it turns out that that was not like a scalable solution because she could only stand in one place at a time. <laughs> yeah. Um, hello. I was wondering if you had any uh, special advice for testing IoT devices where you won't have that much control after they're in production to turn on feature flags or do additional testing? Okay. So the question is, how do you test IoT devices or use IoT devices because you don't have that much control over how they're behaving? What you can do, and this is interesting, is uh, you can deploy all of your code, perspective code, out, and then you can turn it on and off to test the IoT. So what I'm saying is um, maybe what you want to do is test in a particular geographic region. You want to be able to determine which IoT devices are in that region. Uh, for instance, I know a lot of companies who test in uh, New Zealand because New Zealand is in tomorrow, and it has a relatively small population. Uh, tomorrow relative to California, of course. Um, but when you're testing IoT devices, it's really um, problematic because it's very easy to end up with something that's very outdated and old. And so one of the things that we probably want to test for first in IoT devices is we want to do a ping that says, what version are you? 
because if you don't know what version something is, your test is ineffective. So it's a problem, like IoT devices in general are a problem because they are intermittently connected to the internet, but I think that there are some mitigations that we could do to make sure that we are giving them better, more uh, accurate information rather than spamming them with all of the things all of the devices should know. Just before you answer the next question, I see a whole bunch of people scrolling through the page on that, looking for which event to click on. Oh to no, say did they forget they again? You. They forgot. So um, would you, you like them to wait for an hour or just pick a random event? No, because it's, it's the middle of the night. Okay. Uh, pick other event and then type scale conf if there's a uh, place you can do that. There you go. Hi, uh, Donovan from Alan Gray. Um, thank you very much for your talk, very informative. Uh, we're rolling out some feature toggling stuff and we're working on canary deploys. Uh, I guess my question is, have you also, uh, and we're trying to work around A-B testing in the same space as canary and feature toggles and they kind of play with each other, but they are different things. So I wondered if you had any advice in that. So they are, they are the same underlying technology, like the ability to deliver something different is a feature toggle. A-B testing is a layer on top of it that helps you analyze whether or not a variant is preferred. So when you're thinking about doing feature flags, you can use them for so many things, and I find this super exciting and could go on about it forever. Um, but I, I put up a, um, on feature flags IO, there's a glossary of all the different things that I've heard people using feature flags for, including not only canary deployments, but something called an albatross deployment, which is when you have somebody who's willing to give you a bunch of money to stay on a really old version, uh, but you don't want anybody else to know that you're supporting that version, you flag them over <laughs> to the secret old janky version and move on with your life. So when you're doing A-B testing, what you need is some kind of analytical system that's going to either tell you which variant is preferred or going to surface the raw metrics that you would use to make that decision. Hello. Thanks so much for the talk. That was really fantastic. Um, so if you have a distributed system and you really want to make it a robust and kind of self-healing system, um, how would you prevent um, coupling it to your feature toggling, um, like centralized um, system? Oh, yeah. well, okay. So you'd have to make your feature toggle system also distributed and robust. In its well, or you can cache it. Okay. So the, the solution that we've been using is when you're doing a feature toggling system and you don't want to make it dependent on like the one database that you query back to, what you do is you cache the flag state on the near client server, whichever your language supports, and then it will serve with the rest of the, the page or the application, um, and then you only need to talk to the database when there's a change. Does that make sense? Hi. Um, so this is all really great, but how do you convince your clients to give you enough money to do these changes? Um, so, how do you convince people to spend money on best practices? Uh, I, <laughs> I'm literally writing a talk on this called uh, Free as in Puppies, and it's about the fact that we often choose free or build your own solutions in the belief that it's cheaper, but what we need to do is analyze the opportunity cost of what we're doing. How much does it, how much developer time are we diverting to this? How much uh, support time is it going to take? How much uh, is the cost to run it? Like what's our, our downtime cost? What's our cloud cost? Uh, so quantifying the opportunity cost of what you're spending is really important when you're trying to convince people to change things because uh, companies never do the right thing because of the right thing. It's just not how companies are built. Companies do the right thing because you convince them it's economically advantageous. And so if you want a company to change their behavior, you have to convince them that they're gonna save money doing it. 
Uh, sorry, I just wanted to ask, so I, I know you're very much against staging, kill all the staging things. Um, what, what's your opinion on replaying production scale traffic against a staging environment? So replaying production scale uh, traffic against a staging environment works great if you are scrubbing the data correctly. Um, because the last thing you want to do is have a breach on a staging server which is secured much less heavily than a production server. And if you're running production data through a staging server, what you're asking for to happen is a giant GDPR nightmare um, because you're exposing PII on your staging server. And unless you have the same controls, so if you have a good scrubber, if you have a way to anonymize the data, sure. Um, yeah. You touched barely on the uh, difference uh, between a microservice and a distributed monolith. I think that's very common, especially if you have all the code base that you want to pr perform best practices on. Um, I was wondering if you can expand on that a little more about like what are the key indicators that show that maybe you've gone the wrong path and created a very complex microservice that's really distributed monolith. Uh, so I think the easiest way to test if you've di created a distributed monolith instead of a bunch of microservices is to turn things off. Um, I don't suggest doing that in production. If that's a thing you're going to do, use staging. Um, but, but what you want to do is say, can, like, I can't serve data if the database is down, but if the database is down, can I still put things in the cart? Can I still uh, enter, enter some information that will get cached for the database later? So you want to make sure that if, some part of it goes down, you still have a way to store and recall data. And, and I keep picking on database because that's the thing that everybody fails to isolate properly. Um, you know, like People properly isolate their front end or they'll properly isolate their chat bot or, yeah, like that, that's not hard. Isolating your database and caching data until you can get back to the database, that's super hard. Um, but yeah, the test is, if you turn off a part of your microservice architecture, does the rest of it go down in flames? Yeah. Um, so I have a question because I've been neck deep in PCI compliance recently, and it actually mandates that you can't test with your production data. Mm -hmm. um, and you raised a very interesting point earlier that no data is as interesting as production data. Um, what would be the best approach then to make sure that you don't accidentally do something wrong with really old data in production. Um, so the question is, if you're doing PCI compliance, you need to make sure that you are not actually uh, meddling with people's actual data, uh, but you do want to be meddling with data that looks very similar. And uh, frequently the answer is um, there's some anonymization services where you can they do not upload any data to a service to anonymize it. That's not the way it works. But you can get a tool that runs on your internal system. <laughs> there are all sorts of people in the world. That's what I have to say. Um, you can get a tool that runs on your internal system and uh, basically strips out the PCI data um, and replaces it with you know semi-null characters. And then you can test on that without exposing it. Um, the other thing that you can do is um, consider, yeah, again, think about what you're testing and why it needs to be, um, like what the compliance is trying to achieve. Like you can't skirt it too much, like the PCI rules are very uh, firmly written and for good reason, but you can say like, am I trying to test, um, a user interface, well, maybe I can get some, some fake data for that. Or am I trying to test actual, like, does this card run? There are services where you can get, like Twilio has a, a fake um, SMS that you can send that behaves like an SMS but doesn't charge like an SMS, things like that. Um, credit card providers frequently have a number that will behave like a real number, but you can't use it for actual money. Okay, last question at the back. Hi. Um, just uh, in terms of what you're seeing in the industry at the moment, uh, uh, in relation to adoption of service meshes, and if you can comment on whether that's driving uh, 
more people to start to consider production-based testing because you can isolate things a bit more? And any thoughts on patterns of applying that? So the question is, um, as we see more uh, service meshes, are we going to see more testing in production and is it going to drive different behavior? I think it will. I think we are at the very beginning, the dawn of service meshes and we don't fully understand how to manage or test them yet. Um, and I think it's a really interesting problem because what you need to be testing is essentially your images. If, if we have uh, cattle, not pets right now, so we're creating things from Docker and Kubernetes and we have images and they're blessed and we're pretty sure they're secure or we're trying. Um, the next step is what I think of as like bacteria. They don't even have unique identifiers. We don't care if they're up or down. There is a colony that is the service mesh that has a minimum level of health. And the number of servers in it and the number of resources in it uh, determine its health, but we don't know anything about what's in there. And I think that's going to be a really interesting problem because we have to learn to test the colony and not the individual. Because testing an individual image or, or system that can go up and down all the time and be erased and be, and be serverless um, is going to be really troubling because we can't actually see, like, you can test the behavior of a lambda, but you can't test a lambda itself, right? That's not how it works. The lambda is merely a function. It's merely an execution. So we can see if it's executing correctly, but again, we can't see directly into how it's working. So I think we're going to really need to think about what it is that we need out of testing in order to be able to move with the ways that software is moving. You're gonna be able to find me because I'm the only person here with pink hair. So if you have more questions, <laughs> just go ahead and track me down. Thank Great. you all. Thanks a lot. <laughs>